I'd like to introduce Andre Costin, and this is Ghost in the Air. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Andre Costin, and I'll be presenting Ghost is in the Air Traffic. And thank you for coming to this talk. I know it's the last one. Please bear with me till the end. Hopefully, you'll not regret it. A uh, few words about myself. I'm software hardware security researcher, a PhD candidate, and some of my staff uh, and research include MFAC, my very classic uh, toolkit, uh, some printers and postscript research. And if you ask yourself, it wasn't me who was doing the, the stuff uh, one month back to your corporate printers, wasting your paper. Um, and uh, more recently, for a year uh, and so, I have some special interest for avionics and some related technologies. And you can check my papers or security advisories uh, on my site. Some disclaimer. Uh, I'll read the short version, but do not try this at home. And everything you do, it's on your own risk and responsibility. And some Black Hat Administrative, uh, please submit and complete the feedback forms. Highly appreciated. Thank you. OK, so in today's session, we'll just uh, go through the following topics, like a short introduction to ATC. And uh, we'll try to check some of the ATC problems. ATC stands for Air Traffic Control. Uh, then we'll go to ADSB, which is the new technology introduced uh, in ATC. Uh, then we'll try to, to, to look at some ADSB threads posed uh, from ADSB side to ATC as a whole system. Then some sample, uh, if maybe uh, imaginary or real life scenarios, and maybe we'll, dis and we'll discuss some possible solutions and we'll present some takeaways. Okay, so ATC, uh, as it stands today, it's, uh, it stands for air traffic control, and it's used for managing uh, all the air traffic, uh, including on the ground, in, in the air, and its, uh, its main target is uh, basically airborne traffic. And it has a long history, and for the last uh, couple of decades, it's uh, it's been mostly human-oriented uh, human uh, in its functionality, meaning that despite the technology uh, being involved, like radars and the, all the communication links, most of the, the things are still uh, being done manually. And uh, through human interaction uh, of air traffic controllers uh, to pilots and vice versa, uh, checking uh, some printed output from uh, the flight plans, flight tracks, and so on. And despite the fact that it might seem sometimes like a rocket science or it might seem like a very complex uh, juggling stuff, uh, these guys still try to do uh, a tremendous amount of work. But uh, it showed uh, in the last decades that uh, human error is a very important safety factor. And basically, they are trying to keep up with the technology and move from the human-oriented to technology-oriented uh, air traffic uh, management and uh, air traffic surveillance. OK, so we'll just take a quick look of how radars work, because radars are the main technology used for uh, air traffic uh, control surveillance, meaning that the way to, to discover uh, air traffic in the air. And uh, without ADSB, which is the new technology and I'll be presenting uh, later on the slides, without ADSB, currently it's working uh, at two levels. Uh, basically, there is a primary surveillance radar uh, named PSR, and which is a well-known uh, technology, a very old military technology, which sends an electromagnetic beam to, to, to the sky, to its the antenna you see rounding and the airport. And basically, uh, the, the received uh, signal is like backscatter of uh, or reflection from object. And if it's big enough, it's, it's most likely it's a, a, some big object. Uh, up in the sky, which is most probably an airplane. Then uh, into picture comes SSR, which is a, a secondary surveillance radar. Um, basically, uh, with the help, I mean, from the information from the primary surveillance radar, the secondary sends uh, a digital uh, interrogation to the airplane. So basically, it's soliciting uh, a, a reply or a code. And then uh, the airplanes have uh, devices which are called SSR transponder. 
And basically, this device comes into picture and they reply with the specific uh, code of the airplane or code of the transponder. So basically, the first one is non-cooperative, meaning that uh, uh, airplane or aircraft doesn't have to uh, uh, cooperate to uh, scatter back the electromagnetic wave, whilst in the second uh, phase, uh, SSR is uh, uh, interactive or so solicited based. Uh, the idea is that uh, solicitation are done via two ways, uh, via transponders or uh, voice commands where transponders are malfunctioning or not uh, possible. And basically, it's, uh, again, it's a soliciting uh, procedure. And some data, uh, as part of a generated reply on the SSR, are uh, aircraft address, uh, altitude, uh, aircraft code, and some uh, sensor, like uh, roll and track angles. Uh, this is how a very simple transponder, transponder looks like. Uh, and basically, you can see above there is the VHF, uh, voice communication, very high frequency communication. Basically, you can listen to ATC voice uh, stuff. And there's even sites online which you can uh, sniff this for you and you can listen online. And uh, below, uh, the white one is the actual transponder, which in current uh, position or current configuration, is the, it basically uh, is configured to reply with code 1200 to the um, uh, air traffic uh, uh, control center. Uh, this is how a typical secondary surveillance radar display looks like at air traffic control uh, displays and software. It's not very sophisticated. You can see some tracking and some uh, data uh, automatically or uh, manually uh, assigned as meta information to the objects in the sky by the ATC crew and uh, ATC uh, hardware and software. Okay, as it stands now, it seems that even with current technology, I mean, without the new ADSB system, there are uh, still some problems in ATC, meaning that in some manuals, they have very clear effect, effects that uh, inputs are not very robust enough, meaning that uh, an intentional or unintentional input mistake can, uh, can basically lead to the fact that ATC might not be able to see all your aircraft, which is bad, because ATC should be able to see all the aircrafts all the time, and, or it might confuse with, with another, which is, again, bad, because it should know uniquely and at any given point in time every aircraft, who it is and where it, uh, it goes to in order to, to provide the necessary and regulatory safety. And also it can affect, like, uh, uh, TCAS, which is Traffic Collision Avoidance Systems, meaning that uh, the airplanes uh, might get confusing inputs both from uh, devices and both from the ATC tower uh, in case there is a collision possibility. So basically, they'll get uh, very bad inputs. So both will go up and will have a collision up, or both will go down and have a collision down. So inputs are not very robust. And some other like uh, manuals, state that don't add any leading zeros, hyphen, dashes, or spaces to the flight ID, which raises us to the uh, question uh, why there is such a restriction, and by, in the first place, why is there possibility for inputting these kinds of characters, and why there is a restriction? Is this, this kind of uh, SQL injection type of you know, possibility out there, or uh, do they have some legacy systems which are prone to uh, non-robust input handling, which is another issue? Um, then input mistakes, uh, again, intentional or unintentional, can have uh, severe implications, especially in safety or uh, in uh, procedure they uh, basically trigger. And as you can see, there is a manual which says that if you squawk the code 777, it's a military interception operation code, and it's where uh, capitals never squawk this code, but they actually allow you. So basically intentionally or unintentionally, you can squawk this code, and uh, they should, can, can some procedure can be uh, triggered. Or uh, there's other examples which you can, you, you can see highlighted that to, to reach a specific code, you should follow a given pattern. Otherwise, if you switch the, the dials in a wrong uh, manner, you could, by mistake, squad uh, code 7300, uh, uh, which is hijacking, or so on and so on. Um, 
or 7700, which is emergency. So these factors combined with like a stress situation, imagine a stress situation where uh, an aircraft is having a trouble and the pilots have to be very, you know, uh, concentrated on the avoiding uh, safety problem, they have to remember which which dial to 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 switch first in order not to uh, squawk the wrong code, which is again not very wise. <coughs> okay, so ATC as stands now it has some let's say more or less input problems. I mean it's everything is still safe and it works. Uh, there is no doubt about this, but you clearly can see that there are some uh, flaws. Uh, what, what ATC uh, is, um, is for, uh, foreseen to be uh, looking like is it's called next generation ATC uh, ATM, uh, which is air traffic control, air traffic management, and E enabled aircraft. So basically, you can see that from airport ABC down to the airport XYZ, the, the plane takes uh, various phases like terminal area, en route, en route uh, over ocean or hard reach areas again on route and terminal areas and along this route it has uh, it passes uh, ver various technologies like radar multilateration and data communication station and grounds and basically the aircrafts are being foreseen to they, they are currently doing some part of it but on legacy technology but it's foreseen that there will be more more technology improvements and the more uh, bandwidth available so the interesting part which we care about is the middle one where it says broadcast data link between aircrafts and ground, example ADSB. Basically this is where some of the airplane to the ground communication and on top uh, right there's a green circles uh, broadcast inter aircraft. So basically aircrafts can also communicate not only by voice but with some data links between them. Okay, so <clears throat> what is the ADSB from non non-technical point of view? is basically a multi-billion worldwide effort from 2006 and this is a screenshot from uh, government, US government IT dashboard uh, spending and as it stands now from 2006 till now they spend like 1.1 billion dollars on this on, in USA alone uh, and expected similar figures to be in uh, Euro control zone and Australian which are the pioneers in experimenting with this technology. It was like chosen to be a playground for this. However, despite the, the big budget, is literally unmatched security in the sense that if you look on the requirements and specification of, of uh, this technology and search for the word security, you have zero matches. Basically, it's unmatched security. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a little bit bad because safety you, you can still find in that uh, requirements and specification, but not no words about security or the technology itself. So how, how does ADSB work in general? It's, uh, the idea is that uh, let's say there are two aircraft and they communicate with uh, GPS, GLONASS or Galileo kind of positioning systems. They get their precise coordinates. Uh, they use a barometric uh, altimeter to get their precise altitude because GPS doesn't provide very good accuracy on height or altitude. And then basically what they use, they transmit some data uh, and as you can see, they have ADSB out. Basically, it means that both aircraft send information to the ADSB ground station. Okay, and the ground station itself is connected to ATC facility. Basically, the ground station is like a big antenna or pole or something, which is connected by a dat uh, data link connection to ATC tower. Also, the aircrafts can uh, communicate between them using ADSB in, which means that basically aircraft A can send ADSB messages to the uh, another aircraft. Okay, and the uh, very high level of, uh, for format of the data is it's either 56 bits or 112 bits, and in general, uh, the most information is contained in the 112 bits uh, frame. And I'll discuss a little bit uh, down the road, but it has some address, which is basically like a hardware MAC address of the airplane, but it's like uh, some international organization assigned address of the aircraft. It's unique, or it should be unique. Some uh, parity, and the ADSB payload itself. So you can see this is a very simple uh, frame format. 
it has some error detection correction, but it doesn't have any like security as we'll see down the words, down rows like signature or a encryption and so on. So ADSB inside out, what it means is basically most of the ADSB out, meaning that aircraft sending ADSB messages are already implemented. And uh, by ADSB out, you can, you can uh, an airplane basically broadcasts uh, position, velocity, flight ID, uh, and various other uh, geographic altitude, and many, many other uh, parameters, which might be interesting for ATC towers or other airplanes to process that data. Uh, ADSB in is mostly still in, in uh, testing or development because it's a more challenging, uh, uh, it's a more challenging mode because basically the aircraft have to exchange data between themselves. They are very, uh, uh, very quickly passing through each, uh, by each other and there is like very short time of communication so to speak and uh, there is also some other problems like aircrafts do not have uh, uh, fi uh, fiber optics like uh, connection and there is a lot of implications about this. They cannot like check the data which it receives from other aircraft and so on. So basically it's, it's still being in, in development testing. And uh, these ADSB messages, they are uh, basically transmitted on uh, two frequencies. The most used one is 1090 megahertz. And uh, the newer uh, frequency they are trying to, to somehow uh, move the load from 1900 to 978 megahertz. And basically the ground stations or the ATC tower, they interrogate the airplane uh, sending uh, an interrogation on frequency 1030 megahertz. So basically it's interrogation, but all the data from aircraft, they are broadcasting in clear text, uh, non-secure, non-encrypted, on 1090 and 978. Okay, so this is a screenshot from some, uh, some aviation agencies. Uh, this is from Australia. You can see basically Australia is mostly covered by this uh, technology. It's almost uh, close to 100% coverage. So the technology there is uh, very widespread and uh, they have a uh, 2013 mandate to, to all the planes to, to be compliant to this technology. At least ADSB out. On the US side, uh, they also have a map and basically I think it mostly resembles the flight patterns across US uh, where the most flights are being concentrated and basically they have like 300 or something uh, ADSB ground stations which, okay, by publishing exact location of where this ground station is, is not a very good uh, choice because uh, anybody can go and, um, you know, <laughs> do some attacks, uh, some remote attacks on these uh, ground stations. Okay, how does ADSB look like from a user's perspective or from the community? Like you as a simple user, you don't care maybe about ADSB messages, security or non-security, but how it looks like, uh, for you as a simple user. So basically there are various sites, okay, there are various applications and of course there are ver several sites which you, uh, we, which you can go and basically see online in real time uh, all the uh, uh, airplanes which broadcast the information and some users in various geographic areas, they capture this broadcast and they publish them online in real time. So you can see that in real time they show which aircraft, where it's being positioned, where it's being directed, and so on. So basically, there's a lot of public information, which in a sense is not very bad, but uh, in other sense it can pose some privacy issues. Like, for example, you know a specific aircraft uh, address, or you have a specific uh, flight ID you want to track, so easily without any hardware, just logging in online, you can do this. So, and also some of the experimental features, they somehow try to show you a 3D view, like how it looks from the cockpit of the pilot. So, you see that it's quite advanced. Sorry? Uh, well, uh, you cannot watch real time because the data is static on the Google Maps. So, I mean, is the data on the Google Maps is not real-time updated. You cannot see the real-time view, but you, you get, uh, I mean, the terrain at least, uh, the vision of the terrain. So how the community gets all, all this, let's, uh, let's say, all this data 
you see a lot of airplanes. So there must be a lot of users uh, submitting that information. And these users have to be uh, geographically uh, positioned in various areas so they can have a wide geographic uh, coverage of receiving this uh, broadcast in clear text from uh, the airplanes. So basically you can go, uh, effort, buy or build yourself a device and these are example of most known or uh, most uses, uh, used devices by the community and the users or ham radio amateurs and uh, they vary from, uh, in price from 100 euro to 500 euro depending on the features and ease of uh, configuring or installation or network integration but if you do them yourself uh, they can be maybe 20 euros or so on it requires some, some soldering skills but it's not, I mean if you are very interested in this you can do this. So some technical aspects is <coughs> how does uh, an ADSB frame uh, look, look like? Is uh, basically uh, there is, it is uh, the frames are being uh, encoded in uh, pulse position modulation, which is PPM, and the idea is that uh, if one one pulse or one bit is one microsecond, and as you can see, for example, when in the middle uh, it's a low to high transition, it's a zero bit. For example, if you look in the second red section there is zero, one, zero, one, zero. So basically the first bit is zero because it has a low to high transition and the second bit is one because it has high to low transition. And again, zero is because low to high and it's one because it's uh, high to low and it's one because it's high to low. And uh, basically uh, that's a, a 55 bit frame uh, and the first group is uh, basically, uh, I'll explain a little bit later what it is. It's a shared medium broadcast. Uh, it doesn't have any specification for collision avoidance or col collision detection, uh, meaning that if two aircrafts exactly at the same time uh, broadcast, there is basically no, uh, no provision to, to detect this or correct or avoid. But I mean, they can sometimes uh, resynchronize or send a, a different interval and uh, the receiver will receive later the frames but again if two frames are quite critical to be received uh, and they are sent at the very same time with a collision and the receiver meaning the ATC tower cannot understand NIFA of this frame which are both garbled because they, they, they collided and the bits are mangled. <coughs> okay so the format, the higher level format is basically as you can see it's, it's composed of a preamble it's 8 bits long, meaning 8 microseconds, and it, it's not uh, PPM modulated, it's just uh, uh, some pattern in order for the uh, transmitter and receiver to synchronize so that the receiver knows w when uh, a possible ADSB frames come, come to it. So we can detect uh, where to start PPM demodulation. So this, uh, you can see four spikes which is eight, uh, and basically it's an eight bit long synchronization. Then it follows the uh, data block which can be 56 bits or one, one two bits. And uh, both of these formats, if a long or short, uh, must have 24 bits uh, ICAO address, meaning International Civil uh, Aviation Organization, something like this. And they assign unique addresses to each of the airplanes which are globally registered. And also there is a mandatory 24-bit parity which helps in detecting errors and maybe correcting some of the bits. Uh, but again, uh, this parity is not a hash. It's not a secure hashing. It's, it's not intended to, to verify that this message is secure or is not being tampered with or is being sent by a legitimate aircraft. So meaning that uh, this parity can be computed by any attacker any time on any frame. Okay, so let's look at some possible threats for ADSB. And um, basically, the, the threats described here are not, uh, let's say, not quite new, and it's not our, let's say, sole discovery because, surprisingly, uh, there have been a lot of literature on uh, ADSB security, but mostly it was been theoretical or academical, and for some reason, it has been dismissed by the industry or not being implemented for some reason we, d we don't know. And you'll see we'll ha we have in our white paper 60 uh, very interesting references 
and basically all, all, almost all of these are standards or paper which discuss this thread in quite of the detail. But our idea was to, to put up a, a, a easy to, to mount attack and to show how easy and how non-expensive compared to the one billion expenditure is to mount a, a, an attack as you'll see down at the end of this presentation. So one of the threads or, or one of the, the important, one of the most important threads is entity and message authentication, authentication meaning that in, in the ADSB protocol and in ADSB messages, there's basically no provision to authenticate uh, to, 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 to make sure that the message is first of all genuine, not being generated or tampered by an attacker, and second, there is no provision to uh, verify that the message was sent by a uh, true aircraft. What it means, it, it has two uh, wide implications. It means that any attacker can uh, pretend to be an aircraft, and second, any attacker can craft any message because there is no authentication, authentication on, the, on the message itself. So given that any attacker can be any aircraft and can send any kind of, of uh, frame on the air, you can see that the attack surface is quite big and it's not very hard to mount. It's only 112 bits to generate. If you know them how to generate, which we will show down the road, it's basically a, an open opportunity, uh, an inviting opportunity, better to say, for any attacker uh, having medium technical uh, knowledge to, to do the attack. Uh, another thing is that uh, we don't, there is no entity authorization, meaning that uh, because there is no, no authentication, you cannot be sure which aircraft or whether the message is being transmitted by a true aircraft uh, with address X. Uh, you don't have uh, entity authorization, meaning that uh, you cannot enforce or say that uh, this aircraft should not transmit these messages. Because normally an aircraft is being authorized in the first place, so if it has an ADSB transmitter, it's authorized to send messages. But because there is no authentication, you cannot verify that this is a true aircraft. So authorization is like a consequence failure. That's why it's a warning. Uh, entity temporary identifier or privacy, Basically, as in the case of GSM, to make a parallel, because IMZ uh, is a very important thing, they uh, somehow came up with TIMZ, right, if you are familiar with it. So TIMZ is like a temporary identifier for your SIM card. However, in uh, ADSB, there is no temporary identifier. So basically, all the addresses are in clear text, and they are uh, globally unique. So you can basically uh, know and track uh, aircrafts, and again, it doesn't sound very interesting to track uh, like uh, normal airline aircraft, but as I'll show down the road, think about uh, private jets. Like I'll show a scenario where, for example, if you have private jets, it can be uh, a privacy issue. There's no message integrity, meaning that basically an attacker can do whatever it, he wants or she wants to the message, tamper or generate, and there's no possibility to check that uh, this uh, message uh, was uh, tampered with because uh, the attacker can uh, um, change the parity bits or error code bits in such a way that the message uh, is valid and is looking very okay and you cannot say it was tampered or not. <laughs> okay, message freshness meaning that an attacker can uh, take a packet from the air, uh, store it and then continuously just replay and there is no uh, provision for, for the messages to be always fresh, meaning that there is no challenge response protocol. And why is bad? Because, again, a very non-sophisticated attacker can just capture the uh, radio frequency traffic and keep replaying it indefinitely, putting uh, like, um, uh, how to say, a hog's day uh, aircraft in, in the air traffic control, right? <coughs> Sorry. Okay, and there's no encryption, meaning that uh, there's no provision to encrypt the information set, and w which is very clear. So, in a sense, you can compare this, all, all of these failures in the protocol design uh, with uh, all read-write access with guests as admin enable, meaning that basically everybody can read and write 
uh, this kind of messages and they have like admin like power because uh, they, they can do everything in ADSB protocol on, on this frequency. However, uh, they, it seems that there exist mitigations for these uh, problems. Uh, first of all, which is encryption, and second, possibly uh, a message and entity si signature and authentication. But unfortunately, uh, this information is not very public, and it seems it's uh, being used only by the military. Uh, and some of the hints is the mod 4, mod 5, IFF, which means identify fr friend or foe, uh, crypto applique which is a, a specification for this uh, technology. And basically, uh, it's a two levels crypto secured version of MODES and ADSB GPS position. So there is uh, a provision for a secure technology for ADSB messages or ADSB protocol. But for some reason, and for some obvious reason, which I'll be listing down, they, it's, it's uh, kept uh, for military users, but it's bad that they do not adapt it to the commercial air traffic, which is most of air traffic currently in the world. And basically, it uses uh, black and red keys cryptography. And basically, the whole idea is that it's very, uh, as the overhead is very big to manage uh, the, the red keys, which in terms are used to encrypt and uh, so on the black keys. So that's why they possibly they don't want to to release this to the commercial airlines because uh, once the red keys are released, then the whole crypto model is somehow affected. I'm not a crypto expert, but it's, it's, the, it's the, the thing which looks like. Uh, OK, so how can ADSB be exploited? Uh, to understand how it can be exploited, first we need to understand the adversary, because understanding the adversary uh, we understand how, uh, how they can approach the exploitation. So first, by role, uh, what it means is uh, basically we, we somehow try to define roles in the systems. Uh, uh, and basically, you, you can have pilots which can attack this protocol. And I'm not saying that pilots do this, but they are, uh, for them it is the easiest because they ha have access to the ADSB transponders and technology. And it can be both intentional or unintentional. And uh, they can be, uh, there can be pranksters. And as I'll show you down uh, one slide, uh, some pilots actually fall intentionally or unintentionally, we cannot verify this, in the prankster category. And it's not very good uh, in general for safety and for the, for the air traffic. Uh, I'll, I'll just show the example in one second. They can be abusive. Uh, users or organizations, meaning that there can be like pri privacy breaches like paparazzi, uh, one scenario which I'll be discussing, and also there can be uh, some uh, militant or uh, message conveyors which can abuse this technology, but it's less likely, most likely it will be privacy breaches to use it for some monetary gain or some other gains. Of course, criminals, and most likely they'll do it for money, and uh, less likely it is for terror because uh, it, there were no known cases. But a very important emphasis which I would like to, to say is uh, that for criminals we, whose uh, intent is money, do not underestimate the potential of the underground uh, for higher services. And the idea is that it, is, it can be a very profitable business for criminals to invest small amount of money in software defined radios and place them around the world and then start hiring those software defined radios in underground forums to uh, to get revenue on this and uh, you might ask why they would like to uh, basically give them for hire think gsm sniffing and people tracking or message injection in adsb so it's a very potential business and uh, basically software defined radios for hire can be a very profitable one so I would not dismiss this and this might be a potential for the future. And of course there are uh, our old friends from military and intelligence agencies which can abuse for various reasons uh, this technology. So this is an example of internal prankster attack meaning that internal it's the pilot in the system who do intentional or unintentional prankster attack. 
you can see on, on the first column that these are basically flight IDs and call signs input in the system by the pilots during some of their flights. And you can see like there are some sexually connotation messages, some are, you know, some funny messages, and uh, you can look them up and you can, I mean, I'm not intending to, to, to uh, go down by, by those pilots, but uh, the idea is that these things occur even now. So it's a clear uh, thing that uh, this technology kind of thing, clear text and internal attackers can abuse it. <coughs> you, you can see uh, they have vote uh, no or vote something else and you know get a job and so on. So they can convey a message, uh, make a call for action or so, so on on a communication channel which is not very easy to see but still people who, who know how to see this will, will read the message. Okay, uh, external criminals, uh, it's uh, similar to uh, uh, to internal pranksters and basically the idea is as I'll show in the demo because all of these fields can be uh, modified to a certain degree by the attacker uh, actually these fields can be used to encode uh, various uh, commands or information requests and basically in a very Hollywood style scenario which I'm not trying to convey but I'm just trying to say that it might be possible for these fields to be used in a, a kind of a botnet scenario where these fields are used for uh, requesting information and getting information uh, back uh, from other planes affected by, let's say, the potential botnet. I mean, it's a scenario which sounds futuristic, but it's, I mean, if you do a, a security assessment, it, it's a very important thing to, to keep all the po possibilities uh, inside. Um, okay, another example uh, is the external abusers uh, and like uh, privacy breaches and paparazzi combined with public data correlation. Public data or big data is a very uh, strong thing and for example this is a depiction of a scenario where you have a bunch of paparazzi, they have a well defined target a star for example and uh, there is some Cannes festival where a lot of uh, stars come on their private jets and basically the paparazzi or the external attackers they have inexpensive devices as I presented in a previous slide which they can buy like for 100, 200, 300 euros which is a small investment for them and they have access to private details uh, of uh, registration data of aircraft. So basically if there is a star X who owns a private jet on their own name you can basically correlate the address of the aircraft to the owner name. So you know exactly if it's a private jet and you can know who, who owns this private jet and supposedly there's some stars are, uh, are a lot of stars are smart enough to register through other companies. You know that usually this star flies uh, corporate jet X. So you can restrict the subset uh, of uh, uh, potential stars which are flying with that specific aircraft. Okay, and basically you have online all these uh, aircraft registers and it's public data. Why it's public data? We don't know because imagine that all vehicles in the countries would be publicly accessible and everybody on the road can input your license number and see who sits uh, on, uh, on, uh, at the wheel of a you know, black window uh, limousine. <laughs> and uh, surprisingly they have sites where even give you for download 39 megs which uncompresses to 200 megabytes CSV file. This is for USA and the same applies to Australia. They downloaded the CSV with 15,000 aircraft and if it wasn't enough, I mean it's a bother for you to go to all the uh, registers. There is uh, a database which contains information from over 45 countries over 400,000 aircrafts and it's available on Cedrom. It costs about 1,000 British pounds. So again, it's not a very big investment. Any of you, if you get the data, please share with me. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I mean, this is currently available. I mean, 
you can go, just fill the form, pay, get the CD-ROM. If not, if you don't have the money, you just go manually, scavenge for all these downloadable things, and everything is public. You correlate, you basically have everything in clear text, and you correlate, and you can see the impact of, let's say, uh, ap applying a name tag on uh, some of these aircrafts, right? Okay. Now, by location, the adversary can be <coughs> adversaries can be uh, if a ground-based, which means that they sit in a uh, in a van with uh, their transmitters and antenna. They are, uh, it's easier to operate. Uh, it's a plus for the criminal, but it's easier to be caught as well because uh, usually the FAA and FCC in U.S. in other countries the equivalents. Uh, they basically uh, they are very strict about uh, illegal uh, uh, transmission on frequencies, and they have direction finding. And pretty quickly, they, they find find the source of uh, of the location of a trans uh, rogue transmitter. So they have capabilities. So it's easier to be caught, and again, it's easier to defend or mitigate uh, against this kind of attack because uh, while sitting on the ground, uh, an uh, attacker cannot uh, physically, by law, of the phys cannot impersonate uh, an angle of arrival from 2,000 or 30,000 feet. So basically they have array on, of antennas which can detect angle of arrival of a given signal and uh, basically they can detect that uh, a signal has been spoofed by a car with a 10 feet an antenna. However, uh, during the, the risk assessment of this technology, uh, it, it wasn't very, very much attention given to the airborne uh, attackers. And uh, the idea is that airborne attackers are a very potential uh, uh, adversary because uh, the advanced uh, technology in uh, drones and uh, UAVs basically uh, ha have made a tremendous advance last, l lately, in the last couple of years. So it is very possible that attackers can operate drones or UAVs having this uh, rogue transmitting devices, they can basically emulate or impersonate even angle of arrival and uh, it's harder to locate because it's not a ground vehicle and even if it's located, let's say, how do you take down easily a UAV or drone? You need a squadron of UAVs or drones to take down a drone uh, or things like this. I mean, it complicates a lot of, of, of stuff. So, this, vi sorry? Sorry, sorry. Uh, I don't. I don't know about this. Yeah, but I mean, the, the potential is is there for the adversaries to 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 start being uh, in uh, represented by drones and UAV remotely contro controlled. Okay, so we kind of understand our adversaries, and I'll show a, a showcase where it's an interesting one. Uh, does this uh, crypto uh, in the second line, sound familiar to any of you? Like 82,000, 747. Exactly. So we have a winner. So basically, it's, a, it's identification of Air Force One, uh, which is a Boeing 747, 2G, 4B, whatever. And his registration number is uh, VC25A, or a call sign. And it has the ICAO addresses because there are two models. Uh, I mean, there are two pieces of this, and they have this ADF DF8 and AE2FF4. So these are uh, 24 bits in the ICAO address fields, which I, I told you about. So, as you can see, this is a screenshot from iPad made by someone uh, from uh, ex military force. Uh, it's an application which literally takes the data from uh, web services, as uh, I shown you, and basically uh, it puts on an iPad, and, and he spotted this air address code, ADFDF48, uh, okay? So it means that he spotted that Air Force One was transmitting these ADSB messages in clear text. Now they're like, given the assumption that ADSB is uh, clear text and no privacy, there are several open issues based on this scenario, but it ex expands to any other airplanes. So if the ADSB data which was used to generate this screenshot is true, I mean, it was really Air Force One who sent this message. 
I mean, why does Air Force One show itself? I mean, it's a very high profile target, and you don't want like everybody to know that Air Force One is flying above your house, uh, let's say, when it goes to mission in Afghanistan or Iraq or so on, right? Uh, sh when open issues like should this aircraft uh, broadcast their position or not in the first place? So if it's a yes, wouldn't they become easy target? If it's a no, then they lose all the benefits of the technology. But the idea is this, this technology should broadcast that data in order to, to have a higher uh, vision of the uh, air traffic. Uh, if, let's say, there is some orc rounds where they use fake registration numbers or uh, like uh, fake plates, in uh, like uh, old scenarios where, where they put fake plates on government uh, cars, then isn't this like a backdoor in the system? Wouldn't this be possible for other aircraft to use the same backdoor and to use fake call sign, fake addresses and so on? Because it's clear text, it cannot be verified and so on. So if Air Force One can do this, I mean, these are open issues and it's it's, most probably that they use the mode five crypto, which I've been presenting, uh, and they switch to military mode when flying to Afghanistan or Iraq. But again, the shame is that this uh, crypto strong technology, or supposed strong because we want to look further into it, uh, which they use, but is not given to commercial airlines and so on for private uh, jets and so on. The other thing is, if the data is false, let's say the data was, was false to generate this aircraft, I mean, this means that somebody is already spoofing, right? I mean, if it's not a real data, then somebody spoofed the aircraft, the Air Force One. And how do you know that it was spoofed or not? Because you don't have any message authentication, you don't have uh, entity authentication, right? So they, these are open issues which uh, go to uncertainty, and uncertainty is not very good with safety usually. Uh, so basically, uh, we, these are the kind of scenarios which should be analyzed, and all these are possible because the, the technology is not secured in the first place. Okay, there's another potential uh, attack, which the attack is based on fake airplane injection, and uh, when you inject a uh, fake airplane into air traffic control, is uh, what happens is usually is the air traffic control uh, checks the aircraft, and if it's not uh, supposed to be there, it checks cross checks with uh, flight plans and any other information. But usually, it's not fully automated, or not in all uh, air traffic control, it, it, this procedure is automated. So basically, they have to semi manually, semi automatically look up and cross check. What appears on the radar? Is this aircraft supposed to be here in the flight plan? Does it have a path route through this geographic area which we cover by our traffic control? Now, the twist to this attack, I mean, for one plane, the mitigation is clear. We double check, we cross check, we say, okay, it's a fake airplane. But imagine that you do a denial of service on human resource side. Basically, you inject one million planes. You don't have so many persons to cross check the fake planes whether they have a flight plane, uh, flight plan through your area. So basically you can do a human resource uh, type of denial of service. It's a potential uh, attack. It doesn't mean that it happens or there will be no ways to mitigate, but it is potential. However, solving ADSB insecurities will basically nullify this potential. So it will, having a secure ADSB system would uh, nullify the potential and the attack is not there. Another uh, twist to, to the, the same attack is denial of service on the flight space. So basically, when there is an unknown object or uh, unknown aircraft in the space, in general, the, the procedures are uh, international and they have some lo uh, local country variations. Uh, they basically put the unknown object in air gap. What it means is basically, they don't know whether there is a real object there or not, whether it is a bug in radar or not. Uh, they basically air gap that space and they start routing all the airplanes uh, around this spot. So basically, this spot is like a, a wasted area of air space, right? Because they are not sure. There might be something, and for safety reason, they start routing all the airplanes uh, to to not cross that. So imagine putting 
uh, wide uh, spread area, fake planes. So basically you occupy with fake airplanes all the airspace and they have to uh, route uh, the planes for other places and you can exhaust, exhaust all the uh, airspace for that particular uh, ATC. So usually this generates a short term conflict alert when, when you have two, two, two airplanes, one close to another, so that's why they try to separate and keep them separate air gap until the situation is clarified. Given a, a solid number of fake airplanes, you, you see that it's a kind of denial, denial of service. Again, the potential is nullified by having uh, security built into this technology so that not everybody can spoof. Okay, uh, and the problem with uh, ADSB is, as I said, there is ADSB in where airplanes receive data from other airplanes because they don't have a lot of, some of them don't have at all internet connectivity, some of them have very limited. So they cannot verify for any given signal they receive, be it fake or real, whether uh, that signal comes from an airplane which has a flight plane around itself. So basically, you, you introduce a lot of uncertainty in the pilot section because he cannot verify uh, the, the, the true sender and whether there is a real sender sending uh, these messages. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll be closing uh, with uh, the demo. And basically, this is uh, a hardware setup used for, for generating this demo. The demo is, not, uh, all, is still not quite stable, but the proof of concept is there. The idea is uh, that an attacker has a uh, software-defined radio, a USRP-1 in our case, which is very well known, with uh, its prices. Basically, uh, we need some frequencies, which is 1090 megahertz, and which are covered by SBX or WBX uh, daughter boards. Um, we have uh, some D DBS RX2, which is used to verify uh, or to receive uh, signals on USRP. And we also use the commercial playing gadget uh, commercial receiver or enthusiast level receiver to verify our uh, attack. And some attenuators to, to make sure that we are on not emitting too much uh, noise and we are uh, under regulation. So here are some quick references. I'll not go through it uh, after the talk if you are interested in, in playing with all this stuff. Uh, you, you can use this as a quick reference and to run these commands. Uh, basically here is how you capture the data uh, with USRP. Uh, this is how you replay the captured data. So basically capturing some message, uh, you can see it's uh, 1090 uh, megahertz, uh, and then you replay 1090 megahertz and so on. Uh, to craft the data, there is a need of some math and some uh, MATLAB. You can do in multiple ways. We chose to, to modify the data, the captured data, uh, in MATLAB because it provides some, uh, some uh, PPM modulation out of the box. And transmitting the, da the crafted data is the same as replaying the data. You just have some data, modify it, write it to a file, and replay the crafted file. Okay, so, and some other stuff which just help you visualize the, the data you have uh, in the file to be transmitted over the air and to see whether you have crafted your data and if your signal looks according to the correct modulation. So I'll be going to a very quick demo. Uh, it's video and uh, because there are some uh, both technical and uh, legal issues, to, to do such a demo, we will just want to be safe. Uh, you'll get the, the, the core idea from this demo. So what you have here is, it's a plane plotter, it's a, a software, one of several software used uh, for uh, displaying data received from the commercial uh, ADSB radars which I presented uh, initially. So there are some devices, there are some devices, they receive the data and uh, they send the data to, to this software and it shows. So basically you see that uh, our software is connected to, is processing the signals from playing gadget, commercial radar, and will in inject the messages from USRP to commercial radar. So basically we, we, just one second. So basically we, we now capture the uh, real air, airplane 
and now we are replaying it to show the replay attack. And as you can see, that just by replaying it, the the plain gadget commercial receiver received it and it displayed it as uh, ICAO registration number and there is no uh, other information except the altitude in this message. Okay, so just one second. Come on. We'll uh, we'll try to look up this uh, this airplane, and as you can see, uh, there is a site called airframes.org. It has like uh, uh, some kind of register lookup, and you can see that this airplane is indeed a, a real airplane by this address, and it has this registration number. It's an Airbus, and it's used by uh, uh, Airflot Airlines. Okay, now what we do is we uh, took the, 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 the uh, captured data, modified it in MATLAB, written the data to the file, and replayed the modified data uh, back to the commercial receiver. So it's exactly the same message, we just, uh, just replaced the ICAO address. And as you can see, come on, sorry. As you can see, basically, we crafted four messages, and you can see that if you are uh, familiar with Hexor language, uh, we have cafe babe, we have a dead beef, we have, oops, we have uh, three one three three seven. You know what it means. So I mean, these are planes which do not exist. If if we try to to look them up, these these are planes which you can easily see they do not exist. So. The possibility of just injecting uh, fake airplanes is 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 quite easy just by taking a, a real message and crafting it to your needs, or just crafting the whole message from the scratch as as you need it, putting the right address, putting the right altitude, putting the right uh, longitude and latitude, and all the speed and everything, the flight ID, and so on. Uh, so the possibility is there, and it's quite easy. We described in the quick reference and in the uh, white paper. So yeah, this is yeah, some demo details. Basically, these are the uh, raw messages, raw frames, which we used uh, to send. And this, the first is the original captured and replayed, and then we just uh, modified the ICAO address, and we had to just tweak the. Uh, parity information, and uh, I wrote some scripts just to, for any given message, just to calculate the parity and replace it. So it's uh, easy to be, to be done. Uh, some solutions could include uh, verifiable multilateration, and uh, I have two more minutes, thank you. Uh, we have verifiable multilateration, meaning that multiple ground stations can verify a given aircraft, uh, whether it's true. But uh, some uh, analysis document shows that if rather uh, multilateration in all areas is required, um, basically the most advantages of ADSB are significantly diminished. So basically, it's, it's not technically and economically feasible to enforce this multilateration because otherwise the, all the sense of the technology is lost. So it's like you cannot do this solution. Uh, there is some other solution of group of aircraft. And uh, basically, the idea is to, and some other ideas is to use lightweight, uh, lightweight architectures and protocols, open uh, and public key infrastructure like signatures and so on, and send uh, bits, few bits of the signature and signature keys every frame and reassemble them after some some time. Okay, it's not the best, but it it could be one of the solution. So the the takeaways are uh, ADSB is a safety-related mission-critical technology. Yet, ADSB lacks minimal security mechanism, and this poses direct threat to safety. And despite uh, ADSB's tremendous cost in uh, development and implementation, it is easily defeated with under 2K US dollars worth of e equipment. I mean, the balance is not quite okay. Uh, ADSB, some of the ADSB assumptions are not technologically up to date, up to date because it doesn't account for users will have easy access to radio frequency uh, via software-defined radios. 
and doesn't account uh, that users will have easy access to UAV and drones. But one of the important takeaways is the SDRs are not the evil. SDRs are good. Uh, government should not ban SDRs. It helps uh, research and development. The problem is ADSB is flawed and the actual root cause problem should be fixed. So some references you can check after the talk. And thank you very much for being here and for bearing with me till the end. If you have any questions, you can find me here or send us an email. I'll be very glad to, to speak with you. Thank you very much.